The Allied planning for the invasion of France was a protracted, laborious affair. Since being driven from Dunkirk in 1940, the British were determined to return to the continent. But the failed raid at Dieppe in 1942 demonstrated just how costly a large-scale amphibious operation across the English Channel might be. Despite the losses in this raid, Allied leaders moved ahead. Their plan for one of the most ambitious and complex invasions in history continued to evolve until D-Day. The planning of D-Day is absolutely a multi-domain operation. Now, you have a maritime aspect, you have the air fight, and obviously you have the ground fight. Um, you have information operations, you have deception operations. I mean, D-Day is a classic example of multi-domain operations. Prime Minister Winston Churchill famously contended that there is only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them. In early 1942, the U.S. and British solidified their coalition by establishing a combined Chiefs of Staff. From the beginning, the Anglo-American Alliance had competing strategies for defeating Nazi Germany. The British urged a long-term, peripheral approach, while their American counterparts insisted on a direct drive to the German homeland. The British and U.S. staffs also conceptualized the role of the Supreme Allied Commander differently. Based on their flat joint command, the British wanted more of a committee approach that empowered the leaders under the Supreme Allied Commander. The Americans argued such a structure would hurt the unity of command. Even though it had not been decided who would lead the invasion, Lieutenant General Frederick Morgan, a British officer, was appointed as the Chief of Staff to the Supreme Allied Commander. Known as Cossack, Morgan and his American deputy, Major General Ray Barker, started working on an invasion plan without knowing who would lead the operation. Headquartered in London, Cossack laid the foundation for what would become the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, or SHAFE. A successful cross-channel attack was imperative for the overall war effort. Selecting the most capable commanders was critical. Early on, President Franklin D. Roosevelt thought that the position should be held by a British officer because U.S. troop levels were initially too low to spearhead the invasion. As U.S. mobilization accelerated, Roosevelt and Churchill agreed that an American should command. Roosevelt considered his chief of staff, General George C. Marshall, for the position, but ultimately deemed his role stateside too important. In early December 1943, Roosevelt designated General Dwight D. Eisenhower as the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, a British officer, would serve as his deputy. As they prepared for one of the largest multi-domain operations in history, planners examined intelligence reports and sustainment options as part of their decision process. Today, we call these processes the Military Decision-Making Process, MDMP, the Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield, IPB, and the Sustainment Preparation of the Operational Environment. The Intelligence Preparation of the Battlefield, the Military Decision-Making Process, and the Sustainment Preparation of the Operational Environment, they're all together. You can't have one without the other. MDMP, the military decision-making process, that is the overarching, you know, that's where everything comes together. But intelligence preparation, the battlefield with the intel folks, the sustainment preparation, the operational environment with the sustainment and log folks, I mean, they're all kind of doing their things to feed into the military decision-making process. Intelligence preparation of the battlefield is a systematic process of analyzing the mission variables of the enemy, terrain, weather, and civil considerations in an area of interest to determine their effect on operations. IPB allows commanders and staffs to make a holistic approach to analyzing the operational environment. IPB serves as the initial framework for analysis of the battlefield in all operations. There are four steps of IPB. Step one, define the operational environment. 
Step two, describe the environmental effects on operations. Step three, evaluate the threat. And step four, determine threat courses of action. Sustainment preparation of the operational environment is just trying to give the commander the information he needs to make the best decisions. And that's really figuring out where things are that can be used to support and sustain the operation. There are three steps. The first step is to describe the operational environment. The second step is to look at the physical and environmental effects on the operational environment. The third, and probably the most important, is to evaluate the resources available. I think IPB and sustainment preparation of the operational environment go hand in hand and are complementary to each other as sustainment preparation focuses on six factors. Geography, supplies and services, facilities, transportation, maintenance, and general skills. Intelligence preparation of the battlefield nests with the sustainment preparation of the battlefield. Really, they are parallel processes. Obviously, our friends and brothers and sisters there in the intelligence branch, uh, they're getting after it really looking at threat more than anything else. From the sustainment perspective, it is more looking at those physical assets. Clausewitz says that uh, war is a contest of wills. Uh, from a logistician's perspective, math and physics rule the world. Intelligence preparation of the battlefield nests within the sustainment preparation of the operating environment. They both deal with information. Information is the currency and you need to accumulate as much as you can. You gotta find out the answers about where you're gonna operate and for, and for the intelligence community, find out about the opposing force, the enemy. And those two elements work together to help reduce uh, risk and help reduce the unknown and give greater capability to the mission commander. Given the magnitude of the invasion, planners faced a crucible of decisions. What was the enemy's disposition? What resources were available? Is it even possible to move millions of Allied troops with equipment across the English Channel and into occupied territory in only 90 days? But first, the Allies had to define the operational environment. Defining the operational environment is all trying to figure out what the heck is there? You know, where are the, where are the roads? Where are the ports? Where are the key warehouses? What is the road and rail network look? Where are the airfields? What are the airfields capable of? I mean, it is really looking at the, the physicality of things and whether that's northern France or, you know, eastern Europe or a small island in the South China Sea. I mean, you gotta figure out what's there to use because uh, the American Army has always been a very expeditionary army, but at the end of the day, we wanna use things that are actually in the place that we go. During their evaluation of the Dutch, Belgian, and French coasts, Cossack divided the operational environment into six possible landing sites. They created five criteria for assessing the operational environment. First, could air superiority be maintained over the assault area with fighters based on British fields? Second, how many divisions could be put ashore on D-Day? Third, how many divisions could the enemy be expected to throw against a landing during its first week ashore? Fourth, what would the requirements of that area be for naval craft and air transport? And fifth, how many tons of supply might be transported each day across the beaches and through the nearby ports? Based on their analysis, four of the six possible landing sites were quickly discarded. This left two options, the area around Pas de Calais, the shortest point between England and the continent, or the Normandy sector, north of Caen. The analysis pointed to Normandy as the better option especially in terms of being able to limit German reinforcements. An elaborate deception operation was later initiated to convince German decision makers that Calais was the real landing point. Cossack's early plan included a three-division amphibious assault on Normandy, comprised of two British divisions and one American. This was to be followed by two more divisions, one British, one American. An airborne operation would support the amphibious landings. In total, the plan called for 26 to 30 divisions to establish the lodgement. In need of a deep water port, Cherbourg was to be captured no later than D plus 14. 
Once operational, Schaaf would review and expand Cossack's plan. This plan was based on limited resources stemming from competing operations. These deficiencies became a significant problem when Eisenhower, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, and others at Schaaf wanted to expand the landing areas to create a wider front. The original landing sites were deemed too narrow and were enlarged from 40 to 65 kilometers. Schaaf also wanted to add two more divisions to the initial assault. The biggest limitation to adding more divisions was a shortage of landing craft. Churchill barked, the destinies of two great empires seem to be tied up in some goddamn things called LSTs. Probably the biggest data factor that was driving planning for Operation Overlord, Operation Neptune, was the availability of landing craft. There were not enough. The actual date of the operation was driven by when we could get a sufficient number of landing craft to England ready for the invasion. Schaaf soon expanded the amphibious landings from three to five divisions and increased the scale of the airborne mission to nearly three divisions. The operation would begin with airborne units assaulting into the Cotentin Peninsula and near the town of Caen. Amphibious forces from the 1st U.S. Army and 2nd British Army would follow, landing between the Orne River and the Carenton Estuary. Once Cherbourg was captured, the operation would then expand its boundaries, with limits of advance to the Loire River in the south and to the Seine in the east. During step two of the IPB process, the intelligence staff describes how significant characteristics affect friendly operations. The intelligence staff also describes how terrain, weather, civil considerations, and friendly forces affect threat forces. In step two of the sustainment preparation of the operational environment, the assessment is the geographical uh, characteristics of the chosen region, uh, rivers, lakes, roads, uh, weather primarily, um, how that's going to affect possible operations and how it can limit your operations or even advance and serve as an advantage. That has to be taken into consideration because if it is not, it could be very detrimental to any operation. So describing the physical environmental impacts on operations, I mean, we obviously, we live in the world. So what's the weather like? You know, what is the terrain like? You know, what, what time of the year is it? Even back to ancient times in the fighting season. So the fighting season is from the spring to the fall because in the early spring, the roads are too muddy to move anything. I mean, same time, what is the, how is weather going to impact operations? In planning for Operation Overlord, Operation Neptune, the Allies absolutely really concentrated on those physical and environmental impacts. It comes down to really choosing where they would go ashore. I mean, looking at the beaches. Are the beaches capable of supporting, you know, large forces coming ashore? You know, the Allies actually used some of the, uh, the earliest combat swimmers to go and take soil samples to figure out where is the best beach to come ashore. One man submarines, torpedo boats, commandos. We used them all to bring back cups full of sand from the beaches for analysis. It had to be quick drying with a solid clay foundation. It would have to support 30 ton tanks. In planning for Operation Overlord, the planners look, use step two to analyze the geography, the environmental concerns of Operation Overlord. Now, one of the biggest concerns was the Germans, of course, but the other major concern was the weather. What was the weather facility going to be like? Now, noticeably, you know, the weather once you land, but also the English Channel itself, notoriously dangerous and notoriously difficult to operate. The weather has an ever-changing impact on an operational environment. Allied planners wanted to invade in early spring to ensure there was plenty of good weather for forces to advance toward Germany before winter obscured targets, slowed transportation and logistics, and forced soldiers to endure the harshest elements. May was deemed the earliest month the Allies should attempt an invasion. Narrowing the timeline, only six days each month meant optimal conditions for the planner's criteria regarding tides and sunrise. Cossack's early planning had not determined if the invasion should occur at night or during the day. The Allied landings in the Mediterranean were executed under the cover of darkness. 
For Normandy, it was decided that the airborne units would deploy at night, preferably on a moonlit night. Against the Navy's recommendation, Schaefe also decided the amphibious invasion would occur during daylight hours, so the joint fire support could better identify targets. Planners deemed firepower more important than concealment. Each hour needed to occur no sooner than 30 minutes after daylight and no later than an hour and a half from daybreak. Of course, this meant the German defenders would also have good visibility. The Allies selected 0630 as H hour for the U.S. beaches. Shakespeare wrote, There is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. For the Allies, this was literally true of the Normandy beaches. The difference between high tide and low tide was nearly six meters. For counter-mobility, German defenders had been placing anti-personnel and anti-craft obstacles in both high and low tide areas. Allied planners had to make a choice involving risk. Landing at high tide was treacherous since the landing craft could not identify any of the underwater obstacles. Landing at low tide meant the Allies could see the exposed German obstacles near the seawall, but it also meant soldiers would have to cover an extra 350 meters of exposed beach. That was a long way for water-soaked GIs in full combat gear. Schaefe decided to land after low tide, so landing craft could navigate German obstacles and avoid getting stuck on the beach. Engineers were to clear the obstacles, and once that was accomplished, later assault waves could ride the rising tide up to the seawall. In late January 1944, Eisenhower proposed May 1st as D-Day, but he was willing to delay if it meant more resources would be available for the landings. The of the ships that brought them to England. This included the much needed landing craft. The decision was soon made to push the operation back a month. By postponing from May to June, Eisenhower chose an increase in resources over an additional month of campaigning weather. The first dates in June that met the Allied landing criteria were the 5th, 6th, or 7th. Any deviation from these days would necessitate waiting two additional weeks or electing to go against the established invasion requirements. Delays increased the risk that German high command might learn that the invasion was imminent. Eisenhower selected Monday, June 5th for D-Day. The unpredictability of the English Channel threatened the operation as unexpected storms could wreak havoc on air and naval operations. As the invasion neared, the Supreme Allied Commander and members of his staff were meeting with the Meteorologic Committee twice a day at 2130 and again at 0400. Due to severe wind and rain, Eisenhower moved D-Day from the 5th to the 6th of June. Even before the outbreak of war, British intelligence maintained archives on European subsoils, bridges, moorings, wharfage, and rivers. Starting in March 1944, the Terrain and Defense Section, under the G2 Intelligence Section of the 1st United States Army Group, examined the Normandy coast. Their primary mission was to inform commanders on enemy-controlled terrain, defenses, and capabilities. In addition to terrain, the Allies had to monitor an ever-changing landscape of defensive fortifications. Known as the Atlantic Wall, German forces were in the process of building 12,000 fortifications, constructing half a million shore obstacles, and laying more than six million mines. Coastal artillery batteries were especially concerning due to their extended range into the channel. There's a lot that we can learn today about the sustainment planning for Operation Overlord. But one of the biggest elements is how the planning is conducted. One of the weaknesses with Overlord was that a lot of this operational planning was done at the same time. So gathering statistics, one team was still gathering that element and the other team was trying to utilize it. So sometimes they were operating without the full amount of information. 
The Anglo-American Theater Intelligence Service, or TIS, processed information on enemy defenses. They used agents, escapees, evacuees, prisoners, signals, air reconnaissance, and air photos to gather information on order of battle, technical, target, and defense intelligence. Starting on 1 April, the Allies flew 4,500 reconnaissance missions to photograph the situation on the ground. TIS created defense overlays of the Atlantic Wall in scales of 1 to 10,000, 1 to 25,000, and 1 to 50,000. While the terrain and defense section maintained a defense situation map at 1 to 100,000 in the G2 war room. This sizable map showed probable enemy battery locations, the number of guns, the arc of fire, as well as their range, caliber, and orientation. Additionally, the map showed underwater obstacles, beach obstacles, generalized field works, inundation, air landing obstructions, secret weapon sites, and the general density of strongpoints. This intelligence was invaluable in creating the landing plan. An Allied report from after the war described the German effort along the Normandy coast. Beaches were mined, underwater obstacles were installed and mined, gun positions were casemated, pillboxes, minefields, tank traps, and air landing obstacles were rapidly multiplied. Enemy firepower covering the approaches was steadily mounting. Until D-Day, however, nearly the whole enemy effort had been concentrated on the immediate coastal crust. There is no serious threat of defense in depth. While the Allies invested heavily in learning about the shoreline, planners neglected the terrain that led out of the bridgehead. Known as the Bocage, this part of the Normandy countryside was divided by rock walls and hedgerows that obstructed visibility and hampered maneuver. The Bocage favored a defending force and offered few major roadways. Under time restraints for a massive operation, Allied planning was more concerned with the landing and buildup than the subsequent breakout. In the Combined Chiefs of Staff Directive to the Supreme Allied Commander, General Eisenhower was ordered to liberate Allied territories and reestablish civil governments. The exiled governments of the Netherlands, Belgium, and Norway agreed to give the Supreme Commander sovereignty over their occupied territories until he deemed the situation ready for a return to civilian control. This contrasted the complex situation with the French, who had multiple leaders claiming authority. For example, French General Charles de Gaulle refused to assist Allied planners unless he received public assurances of a position after the war concluded. Divides within the French leadership trickled down to the tactical level, where fractured resistance groups on the ground only recognized certain commanders. This made organized resistance efforts far more difficult. Air power proponents had long advocated that the war could be won from above. Some planners wanted to shape the battlefield before the invasion by targeting roads, bridges, and rail lines. Even if cities were avoided, one report estimated the bombing campaign preceding D-Day might surpass 80,000 civilian deaths. Discounting the veracity of the report, Schaaf moved forward with air operations, but attempted to warn locals with radio communique and leaflet drops. The head of French forces in the United Kingdom was also consulted before bombing missions where civilian deaths might occur. The Allies became less concerned with the potential for non-combatant deaths after learning the Germans had been removing non-essential civilians in anticipation of an invasion. Planners had to determine where to fire and where not to fire. In step three, you have a couple categories when you're looking at for evaluating resources available. Number one is show me the money. It is about funding. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, resources are finite and anything that we can't find over there, we're going to have to bring from here. But the other resources available really is what is the host nation willing to provide? The United Kingdom's geographic location enabled the Allies to threaten continental Europe. 
But before this could happen, a massive buildup of forces and materiel had to occur. Allied commanders were continuously reallocating resources to meet demands in North Africa and the Mediterranean. But priorities shifted when planners eventually called for 1.4 million troops to be available in the UK by 1 May 1944. A significant troop buildup arrived in late 1943, exploding in the months leading up to the spring invasion. Many embarked through Hampton Roads, Boston, and New York. By 31 May, 1.5 million troops had arrived, with the majority being ground forces, air forces, and services of supply. By the time the Army's ready for the invasion, there are 1.5 million American troops in southern England. Over 400,000 of them are logisticians. Logistics are more than just possessing resources. It is also about being able to put them at the right place, at the right time. The sheer size of Operation Overlord caused an array of sustainment issues. Items not available in the United Kingdom needed to be imported. In the months leading to the invasion, over a million tons of cargo were flowing into British ports each month. When we talk about tonnage, basically we're talking about the amount of stuff that's being offloaded. Now, basically a ton is 2,000 pounds, but also that also implies 2,000 pounds of class one food is a different amount than 2,000 pounds of class five ammunition. And these are the numbers that have to be planned and come together when you're offloading that tonnage to those facilities. Once in theater, the massive amounts of supplies needed to be housed near their departure port, a challenge compounded by a lack of warehouses and space. Planners had to adopt new doctrine once it was realized that transporting units with their full combat loads was impossible due to shipping constraints. Allied training for the Normandy landings took place even as the plan was being refined and units were still arriving in theater. This training assisted in developing and refining the tactics, techniques, and procedures that were used on D-Day. However, not all of the training went well. In late April 1944, the Allies initiated Operation Tiger, a large-scale rehearsal at Slapton Sands, England, that simulated the upcoming amphibious landings. What started as a live-fire exercise turned into a disaster when remnants of the German Navy breached the perimeter, sinking two LSTs and killing 700. The tragedy was a stark reminder of the danger posed by a cross-channel invasion. Before D-Day, soldiers, supplies, and vehicles had to travel from all over the United Kingdom to concentration areas, then onto marshalling areas located near embarkation areas, before being loaded on ships. The selection of a spring invasion meant the troops could be outfitted with the bare minimum, a lesson learned the hard way in the Mediterranean. Some units in the UK ignored this, only to be relieved of their excess gear once they reached the staging areas. This extra step bogged down an already tedious process. Each US soldier had to be fed the approved 3,300 calories per day, a number that increased when they entered combat. This required training 4,500 new cooks. On the eve of the invasion, soldiers were treated to an upscale meal of steak, chicken, and roast beef, which unfortunately made many of them ill while they were still on land. Meals were soon changed to a sea passage menu of bland foods, less likely to make the soldiers sick during the turbulent crossing of the English Channel. Data analytics is probably one of the most important elements of today's sustainment professional military education. Every logistician, especially at the higher echelons and especially at the theater, needs it. You can't do your job without it. One of the biggest challenges with sustainment preparation is that you're never going to have all the information you absolutely need. It's the accumulation of statistics and a tonnage, and you look at back on historical data for this as best you can, for instance, but is it ever gonna give you the whole picture? 
Unfortunately not. You could go with your best judgment. Lacking data, evaluating Allied resources became a monumental task. By 1944, the Allies had experience with large-scale operations, but data for an operation the size of Overlord did not exist. For example, how were planners supposed to estimate POL requirements when the number of vehicles being used in the operation constantly fluctuated? Like so many of the supply classes, POL demands would rise as units advanced inland. Quartermaster units needed to know how much POL was required, where it was going, and how it was going to be transported. The statement preparation of the operational environment tells you how much gas you got in the tank. Boss, you can go this far. If you don't know how far you can go, you're never going to get to where you're going. American planners had estimated the cross-channel attack would need 6 million jerry cans, a number that later rose to 11 and a half million. Their British counterparts believed the number needed to be closer to 20 million. These types of logistical questions did not stop the Allies from a massive buildup. By D-Day, the Allies had transported 14 million tons of cargo from the United States to the British Isles. In step three, the key point is to assess what facilities are present in the operational environment. You look at the, the rail network and the road network and, 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 a, and a possible river and channel network or the, um, and how those facilities may be used or the port facilities. And you start assessing things and how much tonnage can it take. While the United Kingdom had multiple deep water harbors, planners needed to figure out how to get thousands of ships ready at relatively the same time. This was accomplished by preloading as many supplies as possible, starting one month before D-Day. A bigger challenge was the port infrastructure in France. German high command organized their defense based on the presumption that an Allied invasion would try to seize a major port early on. In the Normandy region, this meant Cherbourg or Le Havre. The Allied assessment of Le Havre found its defenses quite formidable and its location east of the Seine River as easily reinforceable. That left Cherbourg. Looking to avoid the heavily defended harbors in the early phases of the invasion, the Allies decided instead to bring one with them. The idea of an artificial harbor had initially been met with laughter, but Cossack and later Schaaf adopted the idea. Known as mulberries, two massive artificial harbors were to be pulled across the channel by tugboats in pieces and then reassembled offshore at Omaha and Gold Beaches. The plan additionally called for gooseberries, the intentional sinking of old commercial and military ships to create breakwaters. Sustainers planned to use these artificial harbors until they could capture Cherbourg and open the port within weeks after landing. To create the artificial harbor, we began by sinking the phoenixes along a rough semicircle swinging outward from Omaha Beach. Beyond the phoenixes, the bombardons were moored to reduce wave action at the entrances to the harbor. Inside the harbor, the 3,000-foot bridges were assembled, running out to the floating Lobnitz piers. The 2,100-foot sunken causeways afforded dry, firm surfaces for landing at any tidal stage. The seawall was completed by the line of sunken ships. The lateral tide range was 2,000 feet. This meant that at low tide, 2,000 feet of the bridges were resting on sand and 2,000 feet of the causeways were exposed. Note the water depths. The vertical tidal range was 18 and a half feet. The phoenixes were sunk in water that was 32 and a half feet deep at low tide and 51 feet deep at high tide. Their timeline proved overly optimistic when a massive storm destroyed the mulberry at Omaha and Cherbourg was not liberated until late June. Engineers were not able to open the French naval port until 16 July a month behind schedule. Rail lines were not expected to have a significant impact until D plus 50, 
because of the damage anticipated from sabotage and Allied bombing. Unsure of what resources would be available after landing, planners decided to transport rail supplies across the English Channel, including heavy equipment like locomotives, covered cars, and freight cars. To protect the exits from Utah Beach and prevent German reinforcement, airborne divisions were to secure the roadway bottleneck at Carentan and cut off the peninsula. This would isolate Cherbourg and open roadways for the arriving amphibious forces. When intelligence discovered new enemy units near the intended 82nd Airborne Division's drop zone, days before the invasion, the landing sites were moved to the east. Because planners anticipated significant damage to railways, motor transportation was expected to carry the burden for the first 90 days ashore. In spite of this, U.S. transporters were only authorized 160 truck companies by the Theater G4, not the 240 that had been requested. Bridges were another issue that would have to be considered and planned for. To isolate the lodgement and protect it from the German counterattacks, Allied air destroyed the bridges over the Loire and Seine rivers. Operation Overlord is probably one of the most planned military operations in history. You know, years of planning and preparation went into it, and they had to make assumptions, as do all planners. At the beginning of MDMT, you have facts and assumptions. Facts, I got this much stuff. Assumptions, I'm going to consume this much stuff. The most not necessarily flawed assumption that came out of this particular process was the rate of advance and the consumption of supplies. I mean, unfortunately, that would ultimately lead to the supply crisis of August 1944, which of course gave us the Red Ball Express. The purpose of evaluating the threat in step three of IPB is to understand how a threat can affect friendly operations. Although threat forces may conform to some of the fundamental principles that guide U.S. Army operations, these forces will have differences in how they approach situations and problem solving. In January 1944, Field Marshal Montgomery's staff estimated that there were 50 divisions in France, six of which were panzer divisions. On paper, the German order of battle in the West appeared quite formidable. The army alone consisted of 860,000 soldiers, while the Luftwaffe had 325,000 personnel, the Navy over 100,000, and 100,000 more filled out the ranks of the Waffen-SS and police. Their million-man force was responsible for delaying, disrupting, and destroying an Allied invasion. This started on the water. The German Navy, the Kriegsmarine, was in no position to slow an invasion, and the Allies knew it. Without a capable surface fleet, the German Navy was reserved to planting mines in the channel, an indicator of their degraded status. After the war, a German admiral stated that their force could inflict only flea bites. By 1944, the once mighty Luftwaffe was struggling under the toll of a multi-year war. Previous air campaigns combined with the continuous need for pilots and planes on the other fronts had exhausted the German Air Force. In the preparation for D-Day, Allied planners focused on further degrading Luftwaffe capabilities. From Cossack to Schaefe, commanders understood the importance of gaining air superiority. Limiting the Luftwaffe's capabilities also hid the buildup and invasion force from enemy reconnaissance flights. Allied intelligence confirmed that German engineering had created a new threat, vengeance weapons. Of steel construction, the flying bomb is driven by jet propulsion. Into the power unit, fuel is injected under pressure from compressed air bottles. The bomb is kept on a set course by an automatic pilot. Immediately behind the streamlined nose is a one-ton explosive charge. Known to the Allies as buzz bombs or robots, the German V-1s were the predecessor to today's cruise missiles. The Allies discovered the existence of the V-1 program in the spring of 1943. And by the fall, concerns rose after 69 possible weapons platforms were identified on the continent. 
within 240 kilometers of London. Because the V1s were able to hit southern England, Allied commanders were worried the Germans could target Allied bases, staging areas, ports, and ultimately, the invasion force itself. The V1s became operational one week after D-Day. Unbeknownst to the Allies, German intelligence organizations were divided and uncooperative, Keeping German commanders guessing about the location of the intended landing site was absolutely pivotal to the success of the invasion. Before D-Day, the Allies attempted to exploit German intelligence through a series of deception operations, most notably Fortitude, an operation designed to mislead German decision makers of the time, place, and scale of the invasion. Blinded by propaganda, arrogance, and ideology, many German commanders questioned if the Allies were even capable of attempting a cross-channel attack. Others doubted France would be the target. Time would eventually unveil their adversaries' weaknesses, but Allied planners did not grasp the rot inside the German army in the West. Uh, how long has this young man been in the military service? Seit wie lange sind sie schon in der Schule? Vier Jahre. He's been there for four years. And for four years. That's right. Has this young man ever had any combat with American troops? Haben Sie gegen amerikanische Truppen gekämpft? Nicht. He Nicht says fertig. no. Emphatically. No. Uh, what's the age of this young man? Wie alt sind Sie? 14. He's 14 years old. 14 years old and has been in the Army for four years. That's Entered right. the Army when he was 10. That's right. Well, Sergeant, I guess that's about all the information we need off this young man. Intelligence did indicate that many units lacked mobility and were under strength. Still, Allied concerns centered on the panzer divisions that were capable of defeating the invasion. The Allies were right to be concerned. Strong German counterattacks during multiple Allied landings in the Mediterranean had come close to causing those operations to fail. Power disputes between German leaders, coupled with having a vast shoreline to defend, caused decision makers to disperse the panzer divisions throughout the theater rather than concentrating them near likely invasion sites. To slow the anticipated German counterattack, Allied deception plans were designed to hold the panzers in place. Planners also looked to the air. In the lead-up to D-Day, bombers would strike throughout France to avoid tipping the location of the landing sites. Once the invasion started, Allied air would attempt to slow the counterattack by destroying intact road and rail networks thus limiting German mobility. In addition to sealing off Normandy, air forces were also tasked with targeting panzer and motorized units as they advanced toward the beachhead. The sustainment preparation of the operational environment is important because the basic line is that it's there to reduce or mitigate risk. During step four of IPB, the intelligence staff identifies and develops possible threat courses of action that can affect accomplishing the friendly mission. Identifying and developing all valid threat courses of action minimizes the potential of surprise to the commander by an unanticipated threat action. Failure to fully identify and develop all valid threat courses of action may lead to the development of an information collection strategy that won't provide the information needed to confirm or deny the threat course of action. This may result in friendly forces being surprised and possibly defeated. Allied planners were concerned with the composition and disposition of German forces. Questions remained as to how the German high command would react to the invasion, where, when, and how it would deploy or redeploy its forces. Both sides knew that once the landing started and a bridgehead was created, it was essentially a race against time. Allied intelligence estimated the Germans had 10 panzer divisions, and 14 to 17 infantry divisions in reserve. Local commanders lacked the force strength required to defend in depth at every beach, so Schaaf expected the reserve units to be committed quickly. Allied intelligence assessed that the Germans' most likely course of action would be for the defenders to disrupt the landing forces long enough to deploy its mobile reserves and counterattack the beachhead in order to repel the Allies. Germany's most dangerous course of action 
would be the Luftwaffe neutralizing Allied air support and V-1 rockets inflicting heavy casualties on embarking forces, followed by U-boat disruption of the crossing force, the fixing of Allied forces on beaches by local defenders, and a counterattack by mobile reserves with integrated close-range fires to destroy units ashore. I wish the rest of the staff understood that they are a valued member of the IPB process and to bring in the other staff elements like fires and air defense and sustainment because everybody has a contribution to make because the IPB products are fundamental in the MDMP process which is driving the, the larger operation. So at the end of the sustainment preparation of the operational environment, the commander knows the limits of the possible. This is like, boss, you got this much fuel, you got this much gas, you got these many airfields, you got this many roads and railroads, the bridges can only take this. You know, that sets the rails, the you know, right and left rail, for what the commander is able to physically accomplish. The planning for Operation Overlord, Operation Neptune, was very much a data-driven event. You know, today in the 21st century, the importance of data analytics and sustainment planning, it's, it's, it's fundamental. In today's Army, it is crucial that all senior leaders, and not just the officers, but also the non-commissioned and the warrant officers, need to understand all the parts of the sustainment preparation, because it's going to affect all the operations, especially in today's um, FM30 multi-domain operational world. All the areas are going to come together, and everyone needs to understand how that plays into planning and to mission execution. Looking to instill confidence in his troops before D-Day, Field Marshal Montgomery said, when the time comes for us to operate on the continent, no one will claim that our task will be easy. The enemy is in prepared positions. He has protected his beaches with obstacles. We cannot gain close contact and recce his position carefully. So, as to examine the problem and ensure we have the right solution. There are, and there are bound to be, many unknown hazards. He has reserves positioned for counterattack. We have a long sea journey and the end of it, we will have to land on an enemy coast in the face of determined opposition. During all this, there is bound to be a certain loss of cohesion in assaulting units, and even reserves coming ashore will require a little time to collect themselves. The enemy will know every inch of the ground. We shall be operating in a strange country. But we have certain very great assets, and they are the ones that matter. We have the initiative, the enemy does not know where or when we shall land. We have great firepower to support our initial landing from the sea and from the air. We have a good and simple plan. That simple plan was the culmination of years of work. The expansion and evolution of the Allied plan was based on a changing strategic situation, intelligence, and available resources. It was not perfect, but its flexibility over time worked, ultimately unleashing significant combat power into northern France. 6 June 1944, D-Day. It is the story of the Nazi defeat on the Western Front. So far as possible, the editors have made it an account of the really important men in this campaign. The enlisted soldiers, sailors and airmen, that fought through every obstacle to victory. Of course, to tell the whole story would take years, but the theme would be the same. Teamwork wins wars. I mean teamwork among nations, services and men. All the way down the line, from the GI and the Tommy to us brass hats. Our enemy in this campaign was strong, resourceful, and cunning. But he made a few mistakes. His greatest blunder was this. He thought he could break up our partnership. But we were welded together by fighting for one great cause. In one great team. A team in which you were an indispensable and working member. That spirit of free people working, fighting, and living together in one great cause has served us well on the Western Front. We in the field pray that that spirit of comradeship 
will persist forever among the free peoples of the United Nations.